But I think it's important to understand that first you have Satoshis, they figured out how to differentiate Satoshis, then you had Bitcoin NFTs, and now you have BRC20s. And this is all still pretty new, so I don't know what's going to ch change in the next uh, two to three weeks. Hello, and welcome to The Crypto Brief, a podcast from the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. Every week, we get together to discuss current events and trends in blockchain technology, tokenization, DeFi, NFTs, mining, and related aspects of the crypto ecosystem. I'm your co-host, Ryan Stubbe, Director of Bitcoin Mining, and I'm joined by Jason Ward, Head of the Blockchain Incubator, Parth Gargava, Product Architect within Fidelity Labs, and Jack Newrider, Research Analyst with Fidelity Digital Assets. Before we begin, just a friendly reminder that this discussion is for educational purposes only and should not be viewed as investment advice or a recommendation for any security or asset. The views expressed are those of the co-hosts and not necessarily those of Fidelity Investments or its affiliates. As we all know, digital assets are speculative and highly volatile and are only for those investors with a high risk tolerance. So let's dive into what's been happening recently. Hey guys. Hey Ryan, how are you? Hey, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Had a super productive weekend. Got a lot of good things coming up. Some uh, some graduations and some family vacation. But uh, Parth, you've been missing in action. Where have you been? I I actually went to India for a big fat Indian wedding. So that was fun. That was my first experience um, seeing a live wedding. And um, this wedding was kind of over the top, so I kind of know exactly what to, what not to do at my wedding. <laughs> so, so a good learning experience uh, end to end. But uh, funnily enough, I was I was fully away from a laptop. I wasn't keeping tabs on crypto, and the only source of crypto news for me was this podcast. So, good job on that. We're, uh, we're glad here. that we could uh, keep you informed while you were away. <laughs> That's you awesome. Know, so, no, so no crypto transactions while you're away, Parth. No, this was a first. I don't think it's it's been a while since I've like not touched any of my crypto wallets for more than two weeks. <laughs> did, did you remember how to use them when you got back? <laughs> as as long as I had the secret phrase, I was I was fine. That's what I was worried about, like making sure I still had it. So yeah, but no, it's it's good to be back. Good to be back in action. It was also boiling there. It's like it was like one fifteen degrees. Uh, oh wow. In, in and then you came back to and then you came back to New England where you know we, it was 40, 40 degrees <laughs> over yep. the weekend. Yeah. Forty degrees summer, yes. Nice. <laughs> That's yeah. right. It's April and June. This past weekend was pretty rough. But um so Jack's not with us, Parth. I think you probably know, but uh Jack's covering for a teammate who uh who has just welcomed a new bundle. So uh congratulations to uh to that uh person. They were actually a, a guest previously, so uh congratulations to uh to the Kuiper family. And um, hopefully, Jack will be back with us next week. Yeah, let's um, let's jump in. So we have we have a couple of things that we wanted to cover today. So, um, Parth, while you're away, we, we spent some time talking about BRC twenties and meme coins, and we've obviously had some conversations in the past around ordinals and inscriptions. But I think we saw some news last week around a relative first for BRC twenties, and that's a new stable coin that's going to be launching. But I think it, it kind of reminded me that maybe we need to take a step back and compare and contrast these different standards. Um, and, and really weigh the the pros and cons of, of each um, and, and also talk a little bit about the uh, the use cases for each. Um, and then there were some other news, also stablecoin related around Tether um, over the last couple of weeks, um, as early as this morning um, that we wanted to jump into. But before we go there, just um, kind of curious in your two weeks off, if there's um, anything that you've uh, that you've tried. I know you said you were relatively disconnected. So, so I came back um, last Sunday, and so I had a I had a few days to just get back into into things. Uh, so I've been thinking about Bitcoin NFTs, RDs, BRC twenties in general, and I almost felt like like I was kind of late to the game. So, but I realized that Bitcoin NFTs and RDs hit a market cap of close to two hundred million dollars, and that's exactly when I started taking them seriously, right? Because you, the market doesn't lie. So I snagged a couple of RDs or or Bitcoin NFTs. Not gonna name the collection names because they're obviously inappropriate. It's pretty typical uh, crypto terms. But I also bought a bunch of dot sats account, so dot sats, and uh, and I also I put some of them on the marketplace just to see if I can flip them over. But uh, as we know that the smallest unit 
of Bitcoin is one sat or one satoshi. So a dot sats account can represent your public Bitcoin address or your lightning address. So if I want to pay Jason and Jason has Jason.sats, I can simply pay Jason in Bitcoin and just do Jason.sats um, as his address. So it's kind of similar to how ENS uh, works. Mm. And uh, right now you are still getting two and three letter uh, character sats name pretty cheaply. So I, I got a few of them. So I, I got PG.sats, which are my initials. Uh, but yeah, that's what I tried last week. So how does that work though? Can you talk a little bit about the process for like actually purchasing that and kind of how how the link to your your Bitcoin or Lightning address would would work behind the scenes? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the way it works is that you have a dot sats account mapped to every sat that you have, every satoshi that you can have. And that gets mapped to any public address or Bitcoin address that you want to you want to uh, mingle with. So if I if I have a Bitcoin address which is BC one and then whatever the actual digits are, I can map that to one single Satoshi, and that has my dot Sats account. So now if I'm paying money to Ryan dot Sats, it automatically gets mapped to your actual public address if you have that domain, uh, and then the transaction goes through. So it's pretty neat, pretty convenient, and I I feel like. Ethereum had its moment when you could send money based on their names um, or, or their pseudonym. But now, even on Bitcoin, you can send money uh, using a dot .sats account. So a good step towards UX. So I, I have to ask, Pat Parth, do you, do you have the opportunity to actually map um, many different uh, dot .sats to the same wallet address, or does it have to be a unique wallet address? So right now, it has to be unique. And in fact, the worst part is, and again, this is all... This thing, this thing came out two or three weeks ago. So this is all super, super new, barely in any infrastructure uh, out there, but you don't have an option to mint uh, multiple SATs. So you can't do batch minting right now. Each SAT had to be done through an individual transaction mm -hmm. and it's a one-to-one -one mapping. You can't do um, many-to-one mapping as of now. What, what wallet did you use? Do you use like Unisat or are there I used a Unisat options? wallet, yes. For, for a few of those SATs, and again, I know we'll talk about Ordi's um, in general, but when you talk about liquidity, a lot of these SATs uh, are not, you don't have a robust marketplace, so you have to go and make those trades over Telegram and then sort of pay uh, for, for the accounts you want. So not terribly secure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty pretty sketchy, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> Some of them were pretty sketchy. Nascent I mean, to non-existent market infrastructure. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, it's, it, this is like two weeks old. So I mean, yeah, that, yeah. But still, I, I find that pretty neat because I mean, if you've if you've done a Bitcoin transaction, like the idea of God forbid manually uh, punching in someone's Bitcoin address or trying to scan it, like it is it is relatively nerve wracking because if you fat finger something, um, you know, it's 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 kind of game over. For me, my best moment in the week was just getting PG dot Sats. Like that's huge. Imagine getting. PG dot eat, uh, that's probably going to cost me $200,000, right? So. Or like a handle on social media or like even an email account, right. with that, you know, like to think about like even on Twitter, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's really interesting. And it's certainly, obviously, as you mentioned, really early, but um, something that certainly will be worth watching as this ecosystem evolves. So, uh, so Ryan, we go back, like it wasn't that long ago that taproot got installed so that that really is in the critical path right without taproot we wouldn't have dot sats yeah i think that's right um and and i think that's a perfect segue um into kind of what we wanted to talk about for the first part of the segment is you know really just kind of what the differences are you know i think some of these terms are thrown around uh part like you know between you know ins inscriptions versus bitcoin nfts versus ordinals versus brc20s and come out and generated velocity at such a rapid rate um in terms of adoption quote unquote do you want to just maybe take us through at a high level and then we can kind of dig into the various the various areas yeah sure so at least for me, when I heard about Ordi's BRC20s, there were a lot of words which were lumped together. And uh, I had to spend some time to demystify that. So I'm probably, I'm going to do the same. Uh, and hopefully this gives you more clarity on what the difference are, differences are between Ordi's BRC20s, Bitcoin NFTs. And so in really simple terms, the first thing which uh, most people need to know is that you have one Bitcoin and one Bitcoin can be divided into 100 million Satoshis. Right, so a lot of people call them sats or satoshis. So step one was how do I differentiate one sat from another? 
And that's actually where ordinal theory comes in and, and therefore the name Ordies, right? So the whole idea of ordinal theory is to assign one unique ID to each Satoshi based on the order that they were mined. And, and that's the social consensus around uh, in the Bitcoin community. So the first ever Satoshi that was mined was by Satoshi Nakamoto, and that becomes ordinal number zero. Uh, and actually that went for a huge price. The second one would be ordinal number one. Uh, and it's, it's a really simple, basic first in, first out principle. So step one, check, which is figure out how to differentiate Satoshis from one another. And you do that by using, by ordering them uh, individually from zero until whatever the number there is, right? Until, until the point they are mined. Now, step two for Bitcoin NFTs was to inscribe or add data, right? And so Jason rightly uh, pointed out that you have this new upgrade called Taproot where you can inscribe or add text or actually any kind of file. It doesn't even have to be text. Uh, and that gives that Satoshi NFT-like capabilities, right? So that led to uh, Bitcoin uh, NFTs, which means that now I know what unique Satoshi I have and I can also add an image or video or sound to that Satoshi. It's almost like adding metadata to a Satoshi. So that's exactly what Bitcoin NFTs are. And a lot of people just call them Ordies in general. That's kind of the name of the ecosystem. Um, so that's the first part. So now that you had NFTs around in BTC, the question was, can I also mint tokens? Right, so you have tokens like USDC, Aave, Uniswap, and Ethereum. Can I do something similar uh, in Bitcoin, uh, enter BRC20s, where BRC20 is just an experimental standard to build fungible tokens on top of Bitcoin. And uh, the way it works is that for every BRC20 sat, you can do three different things. So first, you have to announce what symbol or what ticker you're going to use, and it has to be a four character ticker. So it could be RD, ORDI, it could be <laughs> like Ryan coin, RYAN, and you have to have a maximum supply. So here's the total supply uh, of this new token that I'm going to create. And then the third, which is the most important, is the function of that sat, right? So when I think about the function of that Satoshi, I could either deploy it as a new token altogether, I could mint it, or I could send it to someone else. So a really simple example would be, I could deploy USDC uh, as a BRC20. However, Jason could decide to mint one USDC on the same ecosystem, and then he can decide to transfer or send that to Ryan. So those are the three different things you can do if you're in the BRC20 ecosystem. So hopefully that, that helps out, but I think it's important to understand that first you have Satoshis, they figured out how to differentiate Satoshis, then you had Bitcoin NFTs, and now you have BRC20s. And this is all still pretty new, so I don't know what's gonna ch change in the next uh, two to three weeks. So part that's a, it's a great breakdown. And when I've been talking about ordinals with people, I, I usually use the comparison to a dollar bill and that each dollar bill has a serial number on it. Now we talk about an ordinal. Uh, you're essentially creating the similar type of serial number for the, that particular sat. Now, you mentioned going back to the beginning, I, I wonder, do sats natively have um, a an inscription or a, a sat number today based on the introduction of this, or do you have to actually uniquely inscribe that when you try to um, essentially create the ordinal? So you have to inscribe that, uh, and that counts as a transaction, but that got enabled only once you had the tap root upgrade. Um, okay, so it's not like Taproot came in, someone deploys ordinals, and every sat that's ever been minted in history automatically has its own uh, assigned serial number, for, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. Yes. So you know the exact sequence of these sats, but you have to go and manually, you have to inscribe something on it. And it's kind of, and this is where it kind of gets funny, right? Because the, the TLDR of this whole theory is that initially you never cared to differentiate between your Satoshi or your Bitcoin. And now you're just giving a name to it since you have something inscribed to it. It's almost like, let's say I have a hundred rocks and I paint half of them blue and now I can say, hey, I'm throwing blues instead of saying like regular rocks. Like that, that's it. It's just renaming a lot of these things. Yeah. We used to talk about it, colored coins years ago. Like, oh, this is a yes. color coin that's not. I mean, it, it is fascinating. So I think now that you've described that there are unique properties associated with a particular um, ordinal, these ordinals may trade 
uh, on exchanges. I, I believe that's now become a little bit more common, although it's still very early. BRC twenties were introduced, what back in March by an anonymous developer, Domo. So we're about three months into the whole BRC twenty ecosystem. And I, I think what's interesting is on the BRC20 versus the ORC20 or the ordinals, one's an NFT, the other can be fungible, right? So when I think about BRCs, they have an inscription that references some series of tokens. If you take a look at the ordinals and compare it back to Ethereum, say, NFTs, one main difference, as I understand it, is that in the Bitcoin space, the actual data associated with the token is hashed on-chain. So you're not referencing some off-chain database, say Filecoin or some other reference for the NFT itself. So the entire process, all of the attributes of a particular uh, BRC20 or ORC20 are um, verifiable on Bitcoin. Yeah. So maybe what I can do is let's let's just maybe take a step back and think about how Ethereum NFTs are different from uh, Bitcoin NFTs, right? So so the the most basic example is that an Ethereum NFT is like making a unique painting, right? So you, you decide to paint on a, on a blank canvas and you also put your signature at the bottom. Have you guys been, been to a paint bar or just a paint and sip night, <laughs> yeah. right? So like, that's the, that's the mental model that I have in mind. Similar quality from those paintings to some of the <laughs> things that you're seeing minted as NFTs. <laughs> right. so, so, so the point is that you have, an op- you have a blank canvas, you draw something, you put your signature, but the value of this painting or this NFT could actually go down to zero. Right, because the value of the NFT is the work that you do on the NFT. However, for Bitcoin NFT, it's like having a book, right? So I'll I'll give you an example. So let's suppose that you have a Harry Potter book. So all the Harry Potter books are the same; they're going to sell at the same price, except if the author J.K. Rowling decides to add a personal message to it, then it's probably going to uh, uh, sell differently, right? But without that message, without that inscription the book is still the same as all the other books of the same name. But adding that message uh, kind of makes it unique, right? And so uh, so that's exactly what Bitcoin NFTs are. Bitcoin NFT is still a Satoshi. It's still a SAT, still a currency, can be used to pay a gas fee on the network, but it may get more valuable depending on what special attributes or what special inscriptions it has. So that's kind of the main difference between uh, a Bitcoin NFT and an Ethereum NFT. And then what Jason pointed out is, is, is absolutely correct, is that typically for ERC-721s or Ethereum NFTs, you have these images and files stored on IPFS or any sort of Web3 uh, data storage provider, right? Uh, but for ordinals, the entire data, the hash is on chain. So persistence is great. Like it's, it's truly immutable when you inscribe on a Satoshi. So... In my head, if there's a document that I want to really preserve for the next hundred years, like the Constitution, then I would I would put it on the uh, Bitcoin chain. Like I would put it as a Bitcoin NFT. So the persistent guarantee is really high. So Parth, just but a question on that. I think one of the the biggest kind of concerns um, slash critiques around this is the the perception that you are impacting the um, fungibility of individual sats by doing this, right? But I think getting back to your your book analogy, that isn't really true, right? Because you can have you know a book that's signed by J.K. Rowling or or not, and it's still the same book. The book itself has the same yes. utility as one that would be signed. Yeah. Right. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Right. I guess just to maybe take it up a click, are there any kind of inherent drawbacks um, or kind of downsides around the the fungibility of uh, of Bitcoin? Right. Um, by, you know, implementing this technology. I, I don't think there are downsides. It's more perceived value on how you value those inscriptions. But at the same time, you know that these inscriptions are based on one Satoshi and one sat is one sat. Right. So that's not going to change. Um, so I don't really see a big downside. One big downside is the congestion of the network, because now people are uploading like worthless ape graphics uh, onto the Bitcoin main chain. And that's like prime real estate. Like Bitcoin right. main chain is like really that that's far more expensive. In fact, uh, I was telling you, Ryan, but I tried doing a Bitcoin transaction like yesterday, three days ago, and the transaction fee is like twenty four, twenty three dollars which is ridiculous, right? Because I, one, 
w- one thing which I was really impressed by when I heard about Bitcoin was how I wouldn't have to pay Western Union $25 for transfer fee if I'm transferring money out. <laughs> and now if I'm paying the same amount to Bitcoin, then it kind of defeats the, the purpose. So the congestion is, is probably the, the biggest concern here. I know the, the growing pains that are now happening on Bitcoin kind of feel reminiscent of like crypto kitty error when, you know, yes. you couldn't get a transaction through um, because of, you know, kind of this this side activity. I, I'm not going to suggest this is the case, but had ordinals been around when we had the block size wars, I wonder how strongly people would have felt. Um, I, I still think we had a good outcome. So by no means am I advocating for any, any type of change, but I think that congestion is I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think for some people it's very good, you know, particular in the mining space when you see that you know block space is being uh, being utilized to a greater extent. So therefore, the miners who are paying, receiving transaction fees may have a better outcome than they would have otherwise. But yeah, it seems to be a pretty polarizing uh, polarizing topic on Twitter and other spaces. Yeah, Ryan, I'm gonna put you on the spot since I know you're a Bitcoin miner, but I know that. The, uh, the, so two months ago, the average uh, Bitcoin block rewards just on transaction fee was close to 0.1, 0.2 Bitcoins. Right. And then it rose to close to four and a half Bitcoins in the last two days. So how, how happy are you? Like, how, how, how do you feel about Bitcoin orities? It introduces kind of um, a new element of kind of revenue generation for miners um, that I think historically, to your point, Parth, transaction fees were really secondary to the block subsidy, right? Um, And I think now, thanks to this activity, it's becoming a much more meaningful um, part of minor revenue. I think what remains to be seen is kind of obviously the former is much more guaranteed and that it's programmatically um, guaranteed by the the protocol, right? Where the transaction fees are really kind of um, predicated on the amount of activity happening on the chain. And so I think it remains to be seen if if the the conditions that we've been benefiting from as miners continue into the future. This has created a pretty divided group of camps, right, within within the, the quote unquote Bitcoin community of those who feel that, you know, this is good and a net positive, particularly in a time when miners have been under tremendous pressure. But then there's the the camp that's like, this is spam. This does not belong to your point part. This is prime real estate. This activity doesn't belong on on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, but then, you know, again, the counter argument to that is, well, it's a it's a, a public permissionless chain. No one, you know, group or one individual can really say what's worthy of, of you know, taking up space on the chain versus what's not. Right. So I think it's really interesting. I think, you know, obviously there is the the short term bump um, that miners have seen um, on the revenue side related to this. But I hesitate to comment on how meaningful it will be longer term, just because, you know, a lot of this kind of meme coin craze, as we've seen, you know, is very cyclical and could evaporate tomorrow. So if, if I can bring you guys uh, into uh, the thought process that I had when you brought up the mining and et cetera, I thought, well, OK, if there's a lot of discussion around the block space being consumed on the Bitcoin main chain, might we see an increase in Lightning Network? Uh, people transacting with their ordinals or their BRC20s using the Lightning Network. And quick check of the Clark Moody dashboard. You're still at a total capacity of 5,333 uh, Bitcoin. So hasn't changed too much. So I, I definitely don't see it there. But um, one of the other stats available on the dashboard is sats per dollar. And it made me start thinking about uh, the fact that someone has come forward and said they've issued a stable coin as a, as a BRC20. Um, I think it's a project called Stable. You don't know much about it. Don't really want to spend too much time getting into it. But if sats per dollar are 3,800 plus sats for a given dollar. If you take a sat and you try to make that sat uniquely a stable coin, how do you maintain the value? We can come back to it. The value of the sat versus the stable coin it's supposed to represent. (laughs) Or do you mark to market to try and keep some equilibrium? It seems like it's a very complex thing, but uh, I I think we're going to be some time before we get uh, any real stable coin usage um, related to any BRC20 or or C20 type of uh, token. Yeah. In, I guess in my opinion, I think it's a BS idea. Maybe once you have the Taro protocol that would actually, that, and they've been working towards a, a lightning-based stablecoin. Once that comes into fusion, you might actually see a, a legitimate stablecoin on the Bitcoin network. 
But uh, I do want to say that I know we spoke a lot about Bitcoin NFTs and RDs. And so I'm sure some people would like to be more hands on and, and, and sort of try things out uh, in this new ecosystem. So if you're but I do want to sort of talk about the risks quickly on how uh, what the condition of the of the infrastructure is uh, for Bitcoin NFTs and RDs. So if you are buying for fun, that's that's great. But if you are buying to speculate over the price of a Satoshi, then I do have to tell you that BRC20s have like a horrible liquidity exit infrastructure. Uh, th th there is no decent marketplace, has very low liquidity. And when you trade these Bitcoin NFTs or RDs, one option to trade them is to find a third party, uh, which could be legit, which could be scams, which could be over Telegram. And the other is to go at specialized platforms or marketplaces. But the security of these platforms cannot be guaranteed since their whole idea was to go to market first and not focus on security. So I would just say that if it's if it's all for fun and just understanding how BRC20s work, that's great. But the liquidity inf infrastructure is is almost it, it does not exist uh, for for these tokens. Still really early days on this. Yeah, I think this is the classic example of having a pet rock. Like you know how when we talk, <laughs> when we spoke about NFTs, like this, this is exactly a, a pet rock because you can do in Ethereum, you can do a bunch of things with those NFTs. But like here, you you don't have a Turing complete language. There is no, there are no smart contracts. So mm -hmm. it's like legitimately just owning that sad and feeling good about it. Well, and it does feel, and I think you mentioned this earlier, like it does feel like people are just trying to replicate what's happened um, on Ethereum on top of Bitcoin and like. What we've said in the past is the, the networks are fundamentally different in terms of the value that they deliver. And I think it's possible that perhaps in the future you see, you know, assets that are, you know, viewed as appropriate to be minted and transacted on top of Ethereum and then assets that maybe are, are actually more um, well suited um, as, as kind of inscriptions on the Bitcoin blockchain. And I think, you know, only time will really tell around, you know, how that how that actually pans out. Maybe we can switch gears a little bit. Um, Stablecoin adjacent, we actually saw two news stories last week. Um, the first was around Tether announcing that they're going to be making an investment, um, you know, um, in Uruguay, um, both in in renewable energy generation, um, which they're kind of coining as a, um, an, their first energy related investment, as well as um, kind of coupling that um, with um, a Bitcoin mining operation to actually consume some of the energy that's being being produced. I think that's a really interesting story, right? Um, obviously, it comes somewhat on the heels of, uh, of Tether announcing that they're going to be allocating up to 15% of their excess reserves or their profits um, into Bitcoin. I think it remains to be seen as to whether these investments into mining um, are part of that or separate. Um, but nonetheless, I think kind of shows, um, you know, Tether's continued push to maybe diversify um, a little bit um, more towards the you know crypto assets and away from you know the the high quality real world assets that um, back back the tether stablecoin um, and then I think Jason you mentioned this morning there was another announcement from tether um, on the heels of last week's announcement that that um, they're going to be making an investment into a company in El Salvador that's using geothermal power to power a Bitcoin mine and that's a company that's being founded by Max Kaiser so that's that's really interesting, right? Those are those are, I guess, three stories, right? Um, that Tether's continuing to increase its exposure both to Bitcoin, the asset, um, and then you know, I guess as proxy, um, Bitcoin mining. Um, and you know, I think it, b it will certainly be interesting to see kind of how they expand their their um, exposure to, to the you know the asset class more broadly. I, I think it's pretty interesting around that because their their CTO kept coming out talking about their commitment to sustainable energy use for mining bitcoin and you know with respect to their uh, partnership or investment in the el salvadoran site uh, with volcano energy looks like it's going to be a combined uh, use of solar and wind with about 169 megawatts of power being generated from solar and 72 megawatts uh, with wind uh, couldn't find much on the uruguay site uh, but uruguay as a country produces about 94% of its energy with renewables, either hydro, wind, or solar. But um, 
it was one of those questions, okay, I'm digging into Tether. I'm looking for some information about this project. I can't find information. Yeah. It's very Tether. The details, you're right. The details, <laughs> the details are a little thin for sure. My understanding is that the, the El Salvador investment is really truly a, an investment in a company that's basically doing a, a fundraising round, right? Whereas Uruguay seems like there's a partnership with a local company to actually build out the generation and to build the Bitcoin mining data center. And to me, that seems like perhaps more direct exposure, again, both to to mining and then again uh, Bitcoin, um, but to your point, it isn't immediately clear how the the structure of these deals looks, as well as their relationship to the earlier announcement that Tether is going to be you know allocating more of its if more of its profit into investments in Bitcoin. I I think the question is whether it's a good good move or if it's a distraction to from all the allocations where uh, Tether has repeatedly lied about their reserves. So we we don't know the answer. Yeah, I think that that for the time being, what we should do is just separate these two things. In terms of looking at the projects that they're taking on, I think the the one in El Salvador is probably further along. The one that in Uruguay, be interesting to see how it unfolds because the reality is many of us in this ecosystem would like to see more renewable energy come online. I, I believe I saw a stat uh, over the weekend. It may have actually been in one of the Tether releases about fifty two percent of. Um, hash rate globally is is powered by renewable energy sources. So, I think the higher I would, that I would caution on that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wasn't think, sure. That's why I said I think it came from yeah. the tether article. Yeah, but there's, it's hard to measure. The, it's extremely hard to measure and extremely nuanced because as we've kind of learned as as the energy topic has become more prevalent around proof of work and Bitcoin mining, you know, you could be uh, you could be tethered, no pun intended, directly to a, a wind or solar you know farm. And that farm could be selling, you know, the, the credits, the renewable energy credits to someone else. You may as well be pulling from a coal plant. Right. And so how these things are measured, I think um, the energy mix of the network in general, you know, Cambridge has done a lot of work around this. I think we probably will be seeing some new data from Cambridge fairly soon around the presumed energy mix of the network. But when you start getting into specific numbers, I always caution because I think it's, it's a, yep. again, highly nuanced. Um, and, and frankly, when you leave, you know, leave the United States, there isn't a whole heck of a lot of transparency around um, where these are sourcing their energy from. But it is true, you know, that Uruguay, you know, they are viewed as a, a leader in renewable energy. Their grid as a whole has a very, very, very high allocation towards renewable energy generation. And so when you think about, you know, having to, um, you know, pull directly from a solar field versus pull from the local grid, it is, you know, a relatively, um, you know, favorable, I guess, if you're if you're prioritizing the use of renewables, a place to be co-located, because again, there's such a high saturation of those assets there. Makes sense. Absolutely. One, one thing that is sure, and then you can trust from the Tether, <laughs> Tether website, is that they are actively recruiting energy sector experts. Yeah. So. yeah. They're, and it's great. Really I mean, I think, invested. you know, that's 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 a that's a good approach. Right. But it is interesting that they're coining it as an investment into energy infrastructure. Right. Rather than just an investment into Bitcoin mining. I think they're kind of viewing those as separate things, which is fascinating to me. And, um, you know, I think on the flip side, again, something we've talked about at length is Maker, again, continuing their push towards allocating additional capital into RWAs, particularly, I think in this case, Jason, um, it was uh, U.S. Treasuries. I think it's just interesting, right? You have one project, the traditional stablecoin pushing towards crypto, and you have the decentralized, quote unquote, crypto stablecoin pushing towards RWAs in seek of a, not only yield, but just collateral diversity. So I think, again, it'll be interesting to monitor both on the maker side as well on the tether side, how they continue to set that allocation and then deploy that um, in practice. Yeah, I think you're right. It's another over a billion. I think it's 1.28 billion uh, worth of a vault for U.S. Treasuries, short term, uh, short term instruments. Uh, it's going to be managed by Block Tower. Um, the vault's going to be known as Block Tower Andromeda. But you're right. So it's, it's a way to, um, I'll say, more closely aligned with U.S. dollar denominated assets, um, obviously treasuries being deemed risk-free assets, uh, relatively risk-free. You know, just this past week, we, we did see the signing of, of the, the law that would address the uh, pending debt ceiling issues. So, um, but it, it, in my opinion, it looks like Maker is continuing to uh, diversify its collateral assets, like you said. But a lot of those assets had been uh, had been held in USDC previously. Right. And following the depegging of USDC associated with the Silicon Valley Bank, um, you know the value of the treasuries itself, as opposed to something that might be 
um, backed by treasuries it would be appealing, I think, to uh, to the the maker governance holders. Yeah, yeah, certainly interesting. Um, and um, I think uh, I think that's all we had for today. Um, Parth, it was it was good to have you back, and hopefully next week um, we have uh, Jack back, and then the band will be back together. <laughs> Um, but guys, thanks. This was a really interesting discussion. Really appreciate the overview, Parth, of um, on the, the Ordinal BRC20 inscription side of things. And, um, you know, certainly, you know, really interesting on the on the tether side as well. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Thanks for uh, tuning in and we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. Digital assets are speculative and highly volatile, can become illiquid at any time, and are only for those investors willing to risk losing some or all of their investment and who have the experience and ability to evaluate the risks and merits of an investment. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. This podcast was produced by Fidelity Center for Applied Technology, also known as FCAT. FCAT does not offer digital assets nor provide clearing or custody of such assets. It is for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide tax, legal, insurance, or investment advice and should not be construed as an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy, or a recommendation for any security or other asset by any fidelity entity or any third party. Views expressed are as of the date indicated based on the information available at the time and may change based on market or other conditions. Unless otherwise noted, the opinions provided are those of the authors and not necessarily those of Fidelity Investments or its affiliates. Fidelity does not assume any duty to update any of the information. Fidelity and any other third parties mentioned in the podcast are independent entities and not affiliated. Mentioning them does not suggest a recommendation or endorsement by Fidelity. This information is not intended for distribution to or use by any person or entity in any jurisdiction or country where such distribution or use would be contrary to local law or regulation. Persons accessing this information are required to inform themselves about and observe such restrictions. Third-party trade marks appearing herein are the property of the respective owners. All others are the property of FMR LLC. Copyright 2023 FMR LLC. All rights reserved. 104.